If you have your Bibles, let me ask you to join me in turning to Psalm 72. It is the section of the scriptures that we're going to be spending um, the rest of our time in. Psalm 72, it is a psalm of Solomon. If you're there, do join me in reading. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Psalm 72. Of Solomon. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. Let the mountains bear prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the children of the needy, and crush the oppressor. May they fear you while the sun endures, and as long as the moon throughout all generations. May he be like rain that falls on the moon grass, like showers that water the earth. In his days may the righteous flourish, and peace abound till the moon be no more. May he have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. May desert tribes bow down before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and of the coastlands render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all kings fall down before him, all nations serve him. For he delivers the needy when he calls, the poor and him who has no helper. He has pity on the weak and the needy and saves the lives of the needy. From oppression and violence, he redeems their life and precious is their blood in his sight. Long may he live. May the gold of Sheba be given to him. May prayer be made for him continually and blessings invoked for him all the day. May there be abundance of grain in the land. On the tops of the mountains may it wave. May its fruit be like Lebanon and may people blossom in the cities like the grass of the field. May his name endure forever. His fame continue as long as as the sun. May people be blessed in him. All nations call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. What we have in front of us is the last book in the second book in the Psalms. Even as it wraps up, it has informed us that the prayers of David, not every single Psalm in the second book is by David, but they're all categorized underneath the prayers of David, the son of Jesse. It is a Psalm filled with hope. And hope is going to be the focus of this message. I seek over the next few minutes, roughly an hour um, or so, to convince you to place your hope for good, your hope for good. When you think about your future and you obviously desire good for yourself, my aim with this um, next few minutes is to, is to convince you to place all of your hope for good entirely on the righteous and loving rule of the king. That's my aim. And I hope that the spirit will take the words of Psalm 72 and apply them potently to your heart. When you think about it, the, the concept of hope and authority, or in this case, as I've articulated my aim, of, of the rule of the king, are very closely related. When you think back at um, 2002 as a country, we had a lot of hope. Kenyans were ranked as some of the most optimistic people on earth. 
What was the reason? No, everybody did not receive an email or a message that they were going to receive a, a pay rise or um, that they had been shortlisted for a particular job or that there was some inheritance that they did not know was coming their way that was, to their surprise, theirs. Now, so that's why Kenyans were the most optimistic people. Kenyans were optimistic simply because of one thing, there was going to be a change in government, a change in rule, a change in the group that had authority. And because there was going to be a transition there, Kenyans looked at the team that was coming in and they were filled with hope. Five years later, we were disappointed because if there was a poll that had been taken at that point, we might have been described as the people who had the least of hope, the most hopeless of the hopeless because violence had broken out. We saw things as a nation that we had never seen before. In many ways, the hope that we had in authority had been disappointed. And you might think that we were wrong to hope in 2002, but that's not the case. We were not all wrong. We have been wired to relate hope with authority. There's someone who has said everything rises and falls on leadership. That might be an overstatement, but there's a truth to that, that those whom the Lord have bequeathed with authority have a particular opportunity that is peculiar, that can affect the people that are underneath them to a great degree. That's the way the Lord has ordered the world. Authority and hope go together, and that's what really defines Psalm 72, in the catechisms, the question is asked, what else did God create? In, in this case, the New City Catechism, question five. And the answer given is that God created all things by his powerful word and all his creation was very good and everything flourished under his loving rule. How do we understand the scriptures? How do we understand how the story began? We understand the perfection that was in the Garden of Eden as a place where the loving rule of God reigned. And everything that was underneath it flourished. We understand the fall that brought about destruction as the undermining or the rejection of that rule. That's what went wrong. We failed, we ceased to respect or to submit to authority. And what happened really to the world is that the, 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 those who were now in authority were, were not ambassadors or, or, or appropriate representatives of the authority of God. But it was an authority that was corrupted with sin, that did not seek his good but sought rather the ends that sin promoted. The psalmist here, then you can see, has hope when he thinks about the future. And all of his hope is tied up to this king. So let's look and see um, the ways in which he articulates his hope. The psalm starts by saying that it is of Solomon. Most likely not written by Solomon, but rather in, in reference to Solomon. Solomon here being the the subject of the psalm. And the psalmist is asking in verse 1 that the king, that the Lord would give the king his justice. Give the king, O oh God, your justice. That's what he desires. The character of the rule that he longs for is righteous. That's the kind of rule that this psalmist is longing for. Lord, we want this king to reign with your righteousness, with your justice. There's no hope if the rule that is extended to them is something other than righteous rule. If it is unrighteous rule, you've all experienced that. You live in a fallen world. That doesn't bring about blessing or good to those who are being ruled over. It brings about pain 
and destruction. So it is natural that the psalmist here is asking that this king would reign in righteousness. But notice this. He doesn't just want righteousness in accordance to man's standard. He doesn't just want this guy to be better than the last guy. He longs that this king would rule over him with the very righteousness of God. He wants this king to be a perfect conduit of the righteous rule of God. Ah, think about the catechism again. Think about the Garden of Eden. Everything flourished under his loving rule. Oh, that our king would be one who would reign with the righteousness of God. Oh, the consequences, the results of that are natural. We will flourish. We will thrive. So, Lord, would you give the king your righteousness? Would you give the king your justice? Verse 2, may he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. Not any kind of rule will do. We want righteous rule. Notice that this individual doesn't just merely want righteous rule. He wants this rule to be eternal. Look at verse 5. May they fear you while the sun endures, as long as the moon throughout all generations. It won't do if this king rules just for a short time. It's quite interesting when you look at the history of Israel, how everything again is rising and fall on the leadership, isn't it? In the book of Judges, you're seeing a judge arise and perhaps some good to some measure for some time, but then things get corrupt and then the nation descends again into moral and political and social decay. And it keeps saying that in those days, there was no what? There was no king in Israel. What they're longing for again is a king who would come and rule them well. Because if they get the right kind of king, the nation will thrive. It's really setting us up for David as an example, but he doesn't quite fit that mantle. And he continues on with Solomon, kind of okayish, right? But every other king, get a good king like Josiah, things are looking good, followed up by a bad king and things are looking bad. This psalmist doesn't want that. He doesn't just want a, a short run of goodness or, or flourishing. He wants it forever. And so he's saying, Lord, would you give this king a very long reign? So long that he would reign as long as the sun endures. The sun endures for quite a while. It's been shining bright before mankind ever graced this earth. Fourth day of creation if I dare put myself on the line there, that God created the, the sun and the moon and the stars. And it's continued to burn bright ever since. Man has been born, lived, and died many a times. And he found the sun burning, and he left it burning. His psalmist is longing that this king would not only reign in righteousness, be a perfect conduit of God's righteous rule, but that that rule would never end. He wants it continuing to all generations. He repeats the same sentiments in verse 17. May his name endure forever. His fame continue as long as a son. What's the hope of the psalmist? The righteous rule of God, the eternal rule of the king. Righteous rule of the king, eternal rule of the king. And not just that, he also is longing for the universal rule of this king. Verse 10, may the kings of Tarshish and of the coastlands render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all kings fall down before him. All nations serve him. He's not just wanting a domesticated kind of rule that affects just him, that improves merely his circumstances or conditions. He wants the rule and reign of this king to not have borders, not just the neighbors to be affected by this, but even far off 
tribes, like those of Sheba and Seba, to be affected by this king. He wants every single knee to bow down to this king. No competitors for this king. He is longing for the universal, the total dominion and rule of this king. Is that the word he uses here in verse 8? May he have dominion from sea to sea, from the river, as Euphrates most probably being referred to, to the ends of the earth. <laughs> That's a lot. This is a big prayer that he's praying here. If Solomon is listening to this prayer, he might be scratching himself right now um, with his eyes closed as he's hearing this prayer being prayed like, uh, yeah, that's, that's a lot. Can, can I keep up with that? Can I, can I aspire truly to, to that vision that is being prayed for? But this nonetheless is the hope that the psalmist has. The righteous rule of this king, the eternal rule of this king, the universal rule of this king that has no competitors. But notice also it is the good rule of this king. He wants his rule to be good. He says it in, in, in this psalm, describing the, the effect of this king in verse 6. May he be like rain that falls on the mown grass, like showers that water the earth. In his days may the righteous flourish and peace abound till the moon be no more. It's interesting language here being used about what the effect of this king will be like. And, and, and he's using imagery to, to help you capture the effect of this king. And for those who are growing up, not in a concrete jungle like we are in right now, but uh, in a place that is filled with flora and fauna, so to say. Th this is a picture of goodness. Rain that falls on mown grass, showers that water the earth. David uses the same kind of language in 2 Samuel 23, verses 3 to 4. And he says, When one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God, he dawns on them like the morning light, like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning, like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. There are so many different experiences that you have of goodness that you can't quite capture into words, right? You can only say, it's like that feeling you get when. For those of you who know the, the feeling of, of that first harvest of maize from the fields that is being roasted on charcoal, that maize tastes better than anything you've ever tasted, isn't it? That feeling of being around that fire, roasting that maize, the smell that comes from it, the, the warmth from the jiko, the warmth from the fellowship. What feeling is that? What, what word is there for that feeling? Is it nice? Is it this? Is it that? You can only say, ah, may all our days be like that. That's a good wish. That's a good desire. And that's what this psalmist is longing for. We want this king to reign with your righteousness, to reign eternally, to reign universally, and that the effect of his reign give to us that kind of goodness. We want all kinds of goodness, objective goodness like peace, which he prays for here in verse 7. Peace abound till the moon be no more. That's tangible. Lord, we don't want to be attacked. We don't want to live insecure about our safety for the future. Give to us peace. But don't just give to us objective goodness because of the reign of this king. Let his goodness even be subjective. That we would have all kinds of goodness because of his righteous, eternal, and universal rule. If you haven't seen it so far, there's no way Solomon can live up to this. We know that Solomon did not live up to this. This prayer in many ways is answered partially because under Solomon, Israel reigned at its height. It was a universal force. It had recognition, yes, even from Sheba. 
queen of that land coming all the way to, to, to seek advice from Solomon. But we know that he didn't reign eternally. We know that even though many kings did come and bring tributes to him, that he did not reign universally. And we know that because he turned to idolatry and adultery, that his reign was not really that good. That in his time, people did turn and started worshiping other idols because of him turning not so much to God, but to alliances that he made by marrying many wives. So who could this psalm be referring to? Well, the prayer is really aimed at the royal son, verse 1. That's the prayer, isn't it? Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. Well, there was another son that rose up. That was a royal son. That was a son of David. And that son is the son of God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's interesting the words that Hebrews uses to describe him. Hebrews in chapter 1 and verse 8. But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. It's interesting, isn't it? That the reign of Jesus is described as a, as a reign that is related to a scepter of uprightness. The idea of a scepter is that, that, that rungu that um, the second president of this land used to carry. Uh, kings would, would have a, a, a long thing that they're holding in their hands shaped either as a javelin or as a whatever thing it is. But it was a sign of their power. In the story of Esther, you have the king spreading that scepter, right, to show that he has accepted that particular um, visitor to enter into their chambers. And Christ, being viewed as one who is ruling, is termed as one who is reigning in righteousness and one who has a throne that rules forever and ever. Ultimately, the hope that the psalmist has that is going to be realized in the reign of the king won't fully be realized until the Son of God comes and he reigns, even as the psalmist is praying. There's many allusions to that ultimate right, um, point of the scriptures, which is, our Savior, Jesus Christ, in this portion. If you look again at verse 8, may he have dominion from sea to sea. There are allusions here of that which Adam was supposed to do. He was asked in Genesis 1, 28, to exercise dominion over the earth. He failed at that task. He did not exercise dominion over the earth. What is the psalmist praying for here? We want a king who will exercise dominion from sea to sea. We want that king who will fulfill that which Adam failed to fulfill. Ah, that's not going to be Solomon. But there's going to be another king who will come and extend that. And that is again our savior, Jesus Christ. When he's wrapping up, there are allusions to Abraham. Verse 17, may his name endure forever. His fame continue as long as the sun. May the people call him blessed. Or rather, may the people be blessed in him. And all nations call him blessed. What was the promise to Abraham? He will make his name great. That's where it all starts off, isn't it? He will make his name great. And all the nations of the earth will be blessed in him. Abraham as an actual figure? No. The seed that came from Abraham, which is Christ, as the book of Galatians shows us so clearly. And lastly, here you have verse 19. The effect of God answering this prayer for the king. The prayer the psalmist is praying here is verse 19. Lord, in your answering all of these things, I'm praying for the king. Here's really the result. Verse 18, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. 
in this king reigning righteously, universally, eternally, what is the result of that? The result of that is that the name of God is blessed forever and that the whole earth is filled with his glory. What is the psalmist really praying for here? The psalmist is praying for everything. He is praying for the consummation of God's grand plan through the righteous, universal, eternal, and good reign of the king. Hope for the psalmist is bound up with this kind of authority, ruling and dominating over absolutely everything. That's the definition, brother and sister, of biblical hope. Biblical hope is not some wishy-washy pie in the sky, neither here nor there, anticipation for some good to come towards us. Biblical hope is tied up to the return of the king, to the rule and dominion of the king. That's what biblical hope is all about. So think about this then. Where have you placed your hope? Is your hope bound up in the righteous rule of the king? That's what the psalmist was hoping for. That's what the people in the scriptures are looking forward to. When Mary was given that good news that she would be bringing forth the Messiah, she references this particular psalm in the Magnificat. In 148 of Luke, she speaks of the life that is growing in her womb as a fulfillment of the prayer that has been prayed here. The coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is a realization of everything that this psalmist is praying for. Realize this, that if this king reigns, good descends to all of God's people. In this psalm, he speaks about the effects or the consequences, not just the character of that rule, righteous, eternal, universal, and good, that's the character of it, but the consequences of it affect all of God's people. Verse 2, all the people of God are being affected by it. The poor and the oppressed are being affected by it. The children of the poor, not just the poor, but the children, those exceedingly vulnerable. The weak and the needy, in verse 13, the righteous, Mountains and cities are being described as flourishing. Mountains have harvest waving in them, right? Think of wheat filling up the farms up in the mountain. This is prosperity that has descended upon the nation. It's a consequence of his righteous rule. And the cities are being described as being filled and thriving with business. People are occupying it. What a beautiful picture of the effect of the rule of this King. In the song, Jesus Shall Reign, we see that hymn writers understand that hope has everything to do with the rule and reign of, of, of Christ. They say this, blessings are bound where he reigns, the prisoner leaps to lose his chains, the weary find eternal rest, and all the sons of want are blessed. Where he displays his healing power, death and the curse are known no more. In him the tribes of Adam boast more blessings than their father lost. Let every creature rise and bring peculiar honors to our king. Angels descend with songs again, and earth repeat the loud amen. So let me ask you this question. Do you have hope? Is your heart filled with hope? Or have you become hopeless? Have you become hopeless because you have been battered right, left, and center? by different things. Have you become hopeless because when you look at your life, it's not really that awesome. When you look into your future, you're like, there's really nothing much to anticipate. I don't have options. I don't have opportunities. I, I don't have contacts or relationships that would give me hope that my future can be bright. I'm not like so-and-so. I was born to the wrong family. I went to the wrong school. I ended up in the wrong career. I was married to the wrong person. I have the wrong 
set of circumstances plaguing my life, illness or fill in the blank. And because of these things, you are at a place where you're saying, I'm not really that hopeful. Is that you? Well, I seek to confront you with biblical hope. You have cause to hope because Jesus shall reign. If Jesus won't reign, you have no cause to hope. And the only cause you have to hope is because Jesus shall reign. Because if your circumstances are different and the reason actually you're hoping is because of the opposite of everything I've said, you are born to the right family, you have the right contacts in your life and the right relationships, and your current circumstances are just right, so you look into your future and you feel like it is actually bright. Brother, sister, that is the wrong cause to hope. None of those things can deliver you. Jesus is our only cause to hope. It doesn't matter if you're insignificant, if you feel battered and despised and forgotten and abandoned. This king came for people just like that. The very circumstances you might be looking at that are causing you to think that you are hopeless seem in this very psalm to be the very reasons that you should be hopeful because you are the very focus of this king. He did not come for the mighty. He did not come for those who are well. He came for the poor. He came for the needy. He came for the weak. He came for the oppressed. And it doesn't matter that in church today we don't even seem to get that still. Because even in God's community here on earth, it seems to still be about the mighty, about the talented, about the gifted, about the people who seem like they can actually serve our purposes. But that's not the tale about this king. Listen to what this king came to do. Why is the psalmist praying these things for him? 4, verse 12. For he delivers the needy when he calls. Lord, do these things for this king. Why? Because he's not like any other king. This king comes for the needy, for the poor, for the weak. When this king came on earth, he showed exactly this. He did not bring about this physical and even political deliverance that the nation of Israel was longing for. But when he landed, when he was born, he showed a, a, a desire, an attraction to those who were least. For the leper, he stretches out his hand and he touches him. A leper who hasn't felt the touch of another human hand for who knows how long. Because everybody runs away from them. What does a savior do? Oh, he comes, he doesn't have to do this, but he reaches out and with compassion, he touches the leper. When the woman who has an issue of blood for years upon years has visited doctor after doctor and has been emptied of all that she has, she has been reduced to nothing. She is ceremoniously unclean, according to Leviticus. She's an outcast. She knows that. She feels like she's nothing in the community and doesn't even dare to stand before Jesus to ask for help. All that she can dare do when she masters up all of her courage is sneak in through the crowd and when no one is looking, touch the hem of his garment. Oh, she had at least that much faith, eh? And that might be you. You may be feeling, like, you know what, I, I have enough faith to, to feel like perhaps I might, I might at least be able to get forgiveness from God, you know. But, but I couldn't hope to have his full attention, to, to, to have his, his full intention to, have, to, to, do me, to do me good, to embrace me, to know me, to work in me, through me, for me. I couldn't really hope for that. I can only hope perhaps for forgiveness of my big bad sins, but I can't hope for a heart that is filled with love, care, and concern, that is proud of me as a proud dad is of a son. Couldn't really hope for that. Jesus stops the entire entourage, doesn't he? And this lady who came in to sneak and take a little miracle from Jesus, ends up being confronted with the love of Jesus, 
who, who pursues her, who speaks to her, who addresses her with those tender, loving words, Talitha, who allows her to depart from that very scene with far greater than that which she came to get. She came for a miracle. She lives in many ways with salvation. She lives with commendation from Jesus in front of a crowd that would despise her and hate her and think she is nothing. Oh, you feel like you're weak and small? Would you know this? This king has come for such as thee. You have cause to hope, even though you see yourself as little, as unworthy. Not with this king. He came for especially people like you. Let me ask you this. When you hear of a king like this, do you not want to serve him? Do you not want to live for him? Is he not worthy of your allegiance, of your everything? Do you not see the prostitute giving up her all and breaking that expensive ointment that fills up the room with fragrance? Why? Is it because this Jesus came and he was so hard and he was so strict and this prostitute was able to live up to his standards? No. It's because this king, whose rule is righteous, yes, and eternal, but it's also good and loving, compels allegiance, worship from those who are least, those who have nothing, those who are nothing. So that when they get the way this king operates, they give to him everything. I and all that I have are yours. Before holiness, before holiness, oh, there must be hope in the rule of a good king. Holiness does not precede that hope that you, yes, even you, can be accepted by this king. Or if you try and approach this king through the path of you are worthy, you are great, your name, your gifts and your abilities and that which you're bringing, you will not, that path will not lead to holiness. But you, if you receive this king as he has come, as one whose rule is not only righteous, but it is also good, oh, the response and the reaction to that then are those that lead to holiness. I urge you to not put your hope in making a name for yourself. Those kinds of motives in your heart and in your mind do not lead to holiness. This psalm is talking about his name being the one that endures forever and his fame continuing as long as the sun. If your hope is in the exaltation of your own name, oh, brother and sister, that will not produce holiness. It will produce everything but holiness, misdirected hope will lead to something other than the holiness that the Lord is calling you to. When you put your hope fully on the rule of this king, on his righteous and loving rule, that very hope is the one that leads to holiness. Putting your hope in the exaltation of your own name is a little bit more like Babel in Genesis 11 than it is like Genesis 12, where God is the one who promises to give a name to Abraham. In Babel, they're trying to make a name for themselves. And in Genesis 12, God is saying that he will bring about one whose name shall be great. Desire that, and that will lead to the promotion of holiness. Understand this, that all the way back in the Garden of Eden, what happened was that people's hope were turned away from the righteous rule of God to the temptations of the evil one. Under the loving rule of God, everything is flourishing. That's what's happening there. The serpent comes in and he says, no, don't trust in the loving rule of God. Mistrust that. Believe that there is good that can be found by you by rejecting the loving rule of God and by doing what I'm asking you to do. And the result of that is sin. 
if you return your hope back to what it was. The loving rule of God is where hope is found. Righteousness thrives in that environment. But if you're even now believing that that which is truly good for you is something other than the righteous rule of God, then you're in a trap. You cannot get to holiness via a path that does not still trust in the righteous rule of God. If in your heart of hearts you doubt that the righteous rule of God is good, but you're still striving for holiness. You're starting off with step two, brother and sister. Step one is believing. When he rules fully and righteously, I get that which is good. There's nothing gooder than his rule over me. That's where it all comes from. That's where life and joy and peace and prosperity are found. And outside his loving rule, Death is found there. So that as the psalmist is speaking of what he's speaking about, this is really the step one of all of God's people who desire to be holy. First John says something interesting. Think about verse 3, chapter 3 and verse 3. Beloved, we are children. We are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. What? Hope in seeing Jesus, what does it do? It makes us pure. You misplace hope, your, your pursuit for holiness is misguided. Before you talk about holiness, you have to look and see where your hope is. So here's my hope for you as you're watching this, as you're listening to this, that before you start examining ways in which you can start pursuing holiness, you would see the hope that God has given to you. Yes, you with all of your issues, with all of your weaknesses, with all of your failures, with all of your deficiencies, would you see that there is a king who has come for people specifically like you, for those who are weary and heavy laden, for those who are, are, are a bruised reed and are smoking flax, for the tax collectors and the prostitutes, for those who claim and they say, yes, we are sick, would you see that this king, whose rule is righteous, universal, eternal, and good, is especially for you. And once you see that there's hope for you because this king came for exactly such as yourself, wounded on the cross to die for you, pursued you, to grant to you life by taking upon himself death, would you then see that there's cause for hope for yourself and that you would be, you would be eager to draw nigh to him and to submit the rest of your life to him? to turn away your hope from the sins that tempt you, from your own efforts to fix yourself, and to instead submit yourself to his loving and righteous rule. And the way you do that is by placing your faith in the gospel. Look not to any other place for hope. Look instead to this king, whose rule is eternal, righteous, universal, and good. And I pray that as he continues to reign in you, you would pray that prayer that he taught you to pray. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, may you begin with our own hearts. Allow me to pray. Father, we do ask that you would convince us through the proclamation of the gospel that your rule is good. Would you free us from the deception that your righteousness will not make us happy? but that our pursuit of the passions of our flesh will. Would you allow us to see that that perfect and beautiful picture of Genesis 1 and 2 before sin entered into the world is the best version of life we could ever hope for? Would you help us to see that the heaven that we long for is the place where your, your, your rule will be perfectly obeyed, where you will have dominion over absolutely everything? 
Would you allow us believing in that today to lead us to yearn after godliness? To speak with David and say, blessed, blessed, happy, happy is the man whose ways are blameless, who walk according to your law. Lord, would you liberate us from the lie of thinking that happy, happy is the man who walks in sin and the indulgence of the flesh. Oh Lord, let the gospel convince us. Let the gospel convert us. Let the gospel renew us. Let the gospel refresh us and set us on a different course. Ah, but oh Lord, would you let it start with the gospel? Would you let it start with seeing that you are the righteous king who came for such as us, the poor and the weak, the vile and the sick. We ask that you would accomplish these things for your glory in your church. Amen.